I would like to now welcome to the stage a journalist, a historian, a Yankees fan. We, we are not all perfect. <laughs> and the most passionate advocate for better media that I know, Joe Torres. Joe? And historian? I mean, come on. I'm barely 41 years old, so too young to be a historian. Well, good morning, everybody. Last year, a Washington Post profile of FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn stated that she had never spent more than two consecutive weeks outside of South Carolina prior to moving to D.C. to join the commission. Do many of us here remember what that was like when we moved to the city hoping that we can actually improve the lives of everyday citizens. But for too many of us, that hope soon faded because we saw firsthand, once those curtains were pulled back, we saw how this town often operates. We saw how lawmakers and regulators were influenced by large corporations to support policies that undermine what's best for the public. We also learned that while the FCC is an independent government agency, it does not operate in some separate universe. It's often influenced, and influenced by corporations and as well as politics as well. But thankfully, over the past decade, many of us have found hope in FCC Commissioner Michael Copps, who has been a tireless advocate for the public interest. And now, over the past year, we have a new champion in Commissioner Clyburn. To be honest, there was a great deal of apprehension from all corners of the political spectrum, including from the public interest community about Commissioner Clyburn's nomination. Few knew her, and in D.C. that's not a good thing. People have to know everything about each other, and that caused a great deal of apprehension. Commissioner Clyburn is a native of South Carolina, where she spent 14 years on the Public Service Commission. She also spent 14 years as a publisher of the Coastal Times, a weekly newspaper covering the African-American community. And during her first year on the commission, Commissioner Clyburn has fearlessly supported policies that benefit the public interest, such as network neutrality and calling for the FCC to reestablish its authority to be able to provide every household in this country with affordable broadband access. But Commissioner Clyburn is also the first African-American woman to serve on the FCC. And during the past year, she has provided a voice to communities that are often marginalized by the commission and by the media. It is a reminder that there's still so many barriers to overcome, barriers that we must be, must have been, barriers that we have been fighting to overcome for nearly two centuries. In 1827, when John Russworm and Samuel Cornish published the first African-American newspaper called Freedom's Journal in New York City, they wrote in the publication's inaugural issue that we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us, from the press and the pulpit we have suffered much by being incorrectly represented. Tragically, those words are still true to this day. Communities of color continue to be harmed because we aren't able to plead our own cause. In recent years, several newspapers have actually taken the steps to apologize for failing to cover the Civil Rights Movement, including the Tallahassee Democrat in 2006. It apologized for openly opposing integration. Many radio and TV stations also ignored the civil rights movement during the 1960s, as they used their station to provide a forum for hate, like WLBT TV in Jackson, Mississippi. The station was run by a white supremacist who allowed the white citizens' councils, the council, to use the public airwaves to denounce federal efforts to integrate the South. The station license was challenged by the United Church of Christ and local black leaders. But the court ruled in 1966 that for the first time, the public had legal standing to contest the license and is why so many of us are able here to, to work today in media reform because of that case. But communities of color are still harmed by the business practices of media companies and our nation's media policies that has resulted in fewer companies owning more of what we watch and read and often covering our communities stereotypically. This is why we applauded Commissioner Clyburn's leadership when she recently discussed why she supports network neutrality, stating that we are living through, quote, one of those rare moments in time where a sea change is actually possible for groups that have traditionally been marginalized. This is why communities of color across the country, groups that the FCC normally do not seek out or hear from, have embraced her. 
She gives us hope that she's fighting in making sure that the FCC will protect our right to plead our own cause. So please, everybody, um, join me in welcoming Commissioner Clyburn. Wow, he, was he introducing me? That's incredible. Thank you, uh, thank you, Joe. Um, I, I think, um, uh, though, uh, you know, being a, a public official, uh, you have a tendency not to make a lot of money. But I think I'm going to uh, uh, do everything in my power to every place I go, everywhere I go. I think I would like Joe to come with me. So, <laughs> so accepting all collections. I'm sorry. Uh, again, really, I want to thank you so much um, for that kind introduction. Joe mentioned one of our first encounters, which um, happened on the campus of Howard University, where I uh, affirmed uh, loudly uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my stance on network neutrality. When I got off that stage, I could just tell by the silence of the audience, you know how they say the proverbial pin drop, I, you know, I think the pin would have been <laughs> you know, deafening to me you know, because I, it was, I could just tell. Um, that I'd said something that got some attention. Uh, Joe was the first face that I saw that said to me, there are people who are with you. And oftentimes when uh, public policy makers make a stand uh, that we know may go against the grain or, or stances that um, we know that may be unpopular to some powerful uh, voices, um, we need an affirmation, we need a Joe that says, there are people out here with you, and you will know. We will not be silent. I can't affirm to you how reassuring that was at a time where I was literally shaking coming off that stage, literally shaking. We need people like those in this room to reassure those like me that we're not alone. So thank you, Joe, for reaffirming that I'm not alone. Thank you so much. I am also grateful, of course, to, to all of you uh, from Free Press for including me, me in today's summit. Since its inception, Free Press has contributed a great deal to the communications world, and I am thankful that your efforts and commitment have not wavered. It is also wonderful for me to see so many faces that I do not know here in this room. I, it is my hope to get better acquainted with each of you over the coming weeks, as there are so many lively communications issues in play that have a direct impact on our daily lives. One of the most important issues is the Commission's Future of the Media Project, which is directly relevant to the general discussion at the heart of this event. It is critical that we take stock of the many changes in the news and information marketplace in order to execute our jobs properly. Without a single, without a hand on the current state of the media business and a sense of where it might migrate in the near future, it will be impossible for us to tackle critical issues such as the impact of cre increased media concentration. Before I say more about the substance of the day's summit, I thought, uh, given emphasis today, uh, your emphasis today on turning ideas into action, uh, it might be useful for me to focus more on the process of effecting media uh, meaningful change in today's environment. Unfortunately, bringing ideas meaningful ideas uh, in, into action is not as simple as providing the most cogent argument or outworking those with opposing viewpoints. Rather, everyone is in this room must understand that all things that go into decision making in Washington, and specifically here at the FCC, before creating a plan in order to make a difference, we've got to know exactly, exactly what we're up against. In my view, there are at least three important environmental factors you must come to terms with before developing any successful campaign for change. The first factor is that the federal government often, often has a tendency to, to look inward, that is, to and among the usual players, in order to determine its policy direction. Many of us have grown quite comfortable in D.C. We have our experts and surveys and studies that support our work. But what we tend not to have is regular contact with the people most impacted by our decisions. In my view, this is something that must change. Perhaps I come to this issue with an unfair bias. 
I am about as outside of the beltway as a commissioner as you will find. Until I was sworn in uh, in this past August, if you heard, I spent basically my entire life. In South Carolina, I had a little bit of urban experience. If you call South Carolina a little bit urban, in some spots, I had plenty of rural experience since we're classified as a rural state. Though I have no farm experience, so let's all of which, as I affirm, happened outside of Washington, D.C. So it is amusing for me that from time to time a close friend or a colleague would suggest to me that I downplay my significant time outside of Washington. There is no doubt that their hearts are in the right places. In many local circles, my background may serve as a strike against me. I did not arrive, as you know, at the commission as a known quantity. Some of you have written about that uh, a couple of times or two. But I see this as a major plus. I believe that we are better off having a commission that includes a mix of those people who know the Washington game well and those people like me who have spent a good deal more time outside of it. And thank you, thank you. <laughs> and outside of the Beltway mindset can open up a public official to a different type of discourse. You tend to learn more about what people unconnected to the political world think. How do consumers feel about their cell phone experience? Can consumers afford broadband service in rural and urban America? Do consumers believe they are receiving the local news and information most relevant to their lives? There is a tendency in Washington to get caught up in all things DC and lose sight of the people throughout the country that we have been placed here to serve. This state of affairs is not an indictment on any individual or result of any misguided intent. Rather, there has, been, there has emerged a preference for political swordplay, that is, how best to outmaneuver your opponent, which may trump substantive debate and finding the answer that makes the most sense. This is why I encourage more interaction with consumers beyond the Beltway. It is critical that we hear from people and speak with people about what is most important to them and engage with them on why we make the decisions we do. That two-way communication is essential to good governance. A great start down this path would be for the Commission to hold public hearings on the proposed Comcast-MBCU merger outside of Washington, D.C. I know that you all, as I've affirmed just now, uh, 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 support that view. Obviously, we do not have the resources to travel the country getting individualized views from every city and town, but we do have the ability to hold more than one hearing in places where consumers will be directly affected, either positively or negatively, by this landmark, and we recognize it's a landmark transaction. What what value would hearings outside the Beltway bring? First and foremost, they will force the Commission to interact and see up close how Americans feel about this proposed merger. Most of our days are spent poring over electronic and paper filings of briefs and short comments in the comforts of our own offices. It is far different to hear directly from the public. You feel the passion these issues generate. You better understand people's views, and you may even, even see areas of misunderstanding and how our message may be distorted by the time it reaches people across the country. A second environmental factor that we must, must contend with is the outsized influence of Washington lobbyists. I cannot overstate the incredible advantage well-funded companies and organizations have when it comes to making their voices heard. Lobbying in Washington is a sophisticated business. None of us is to say that lobbying, per se, is problematic. Indeed, already during my tenure, I have benefited, actually benefited, from the insights of lobbyists who have helped illuminate some of the key aspects of their clients' positions. This can be an invaluable service. However, the most effective lobbyists can give their clients a huge advantage over the less experienced, interested parties. They know how we make decisions. 
when we make decisions, and often they have access to information that many commission officials themselves do not yet have. These elements, I don't have to say, but I will say, these elements make a difference. So what this means is that as individuals and smaller organizations, you have to create, come have creative ways to level the lobbying playing field. One avenue is joining forces, and I've always already seen it, on areas of agreement to form a stronger overall unit. This may also mean linking with those in Washington who understand the ebbs and pl flows of administrative agencies in order to figure out who the right folks are to speak with and when to pursue those individuals. When it comes to the FCC, it is important to understand how the Commission works, our filings, how and when we vote, and how best to assert yourselves. A third factor that you must grapple with is the battle of the message. In today's soundbite age, some have fared much better than others. Nuance simply is not valued by many, and getting the word out can be a challenge. Mastering this element is, both, is crucial both to disseminating your own positive arguments and to counteracting any misinformation that has permeated the community. Nowhere is this challenge more apparent than in the current debate over, over whether the Commission should reclassify the transmission component of broadband from an information service to a telecommunications service. The upshot of reclassification is that under the latter classification, telecommunications service, the Commission has more regulatory authority. This issue was resurrected recently in the wake of an important decision by the D.C. Circuit that significantly narrowed the Commission's authority over broadband under Title I. An unfortunate reality is that having an open forum with reasonable and honest debate in this sphere appears unlikely. Instead, the lobbying machine for some extremely powerful interests has already begun churning out noteworthy lines at a rapid pace. If you'll indulge me, let me offer three quick examples of what we are up against. First, some individuals are now asserting that the D.C. Circuit actually held that the Commission has no authority whatsoever to regulate broadband. This is patently untrue. The court said only, and of course, I am paraphrasing, that the Commission has limited, if any, authority under Title I of the Communications Act to enact certain regulations concerning broadband. It said nothing, nothing about the Commission's authority under Title II of the Act. Thus, the decision plainly left open the possibility that the Commission could have the authority under Title II. Second, Others are now asserting that the chairman is seeking to enact burdensome rules similar to what we had in place during the early Ma Bell monopoly era. But that argument could not be further from the truth. In fact, we are merely looking to preserve the authority that almost everyone assumed we had under Title I prior to the court's decision. The chairman has made clear that he intends to concurrently forbear from applying a vast majority of the 48 regulatory provisions of Title II. Does this sound like old-style old regulation to you? Of course not. But that doesn't stop the messaging machine from rolling forward. And third, this is my first personal favorite, is a claim that the Commission is trying to take over the Internet. At the outset, it must be made absolutely clear that the issue of reclassification goes far beyond our open Internet proceeding. It involves some of the most important parts of a national broadband plan, universal service, privacy, transparency, and cybersecurity. Without reclassification, the road to achieving each of these issues is laden with landmines and is likely to fail. In addition, even with respect to the open Internet proceeding, the Commission is attempting to preserve the open character of the net. In fact, we are trying to keep the Internet in your hands and not in the hands of industry gatekeepers. 
The only threatened takeover of the Internet is by industry. If they begin to restrict access, prioritize their own offerings, or make other critical changes to the structure of what has been an incredible economic driver as an open platform, then we all should be concerned. As you can see, we all have our work cut out for us. Indeed, each of these three environmental pack factors I point out will play an, a role in nearly every debate that emerges in the near future. It is no different when we consider the future of the media, and specifically the role of the public media in the coming decades. I believe very strongly in our need to address proactively the way our communities and our nation as a whole receives news and information. A thriving democracy depends on an actively engaged and informed public. An important feature, if not the single most important feature, of an informed public is a tenacious, tenacious and rigorous media core. It has become clear, however, that in the digital age, the old business models to support journalism are no longer satisfactory. And today, we are grappling with the new ones. One thing that is clear to me is that some of the developing models for a successful media do not necessarily line up with the notions that drive strong, independent news gathering. So we have to be able to ask the tough questions. How can we, as a society, provide avenues to useful information? Avenues that are not necessarily profit generators. And this is why the support of public media is critical. There are those inside and outside of the FCC that do not want us to probe this arena and evaluate the state of the media marketplace. They argue that this is beyond our jurisdiction and that we should focus our efforts elsewhere. This messaging is beginning to take shape as part of an environment I discussed earlier. It will take your organizational skills messaging skills, and patience in order to counteract an environment unfriendly to real discourse and public debate. I urge you all to stay committed to this endeavor despite the difficulties you will inevitably encounter. I will rely on your contributions as I figure out this complex issue. I will remain committed to separating the noise from the reason argument and thoughtful exchanges, and I will stay open to new ideas and to public input. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my time with you this morning, and I look forward to getting better acquainted in the near future.